Hello and welcome to This Week in Big Sky Basketball. I'm your host, Denise Thompson, and I am joined by Coulter Nunez of Skyline Sports. How are you doing today, Coulter? Very good. Thanks so much for having me. So heading into the last weekend of the regular season for Big Sky men's and women's basketball, last week you told us who you thought your all-conference team would be on the men's and the women's side. But this week we're going to give you a little bit more pressure and we're going to ask you, who do you think that this year's women's basketball MVP is going to be? Well, I think that the thing that's been most fun about covering the league this year is here we are going into the final weekend of the regular season and we still don't have a defined league champion. And I think because of that, that we still don't have a defined MVP as well. There's three teams still in the women's race. That league championship. Idaho wins. If Idaho wins and if Montana State wins the championship, I'll give you who I think the MVP should be from each of those teams. Because I like to give it to the I, – I think that the MVP deserves to go to the best player or the most valuable player on the conference championship team. So we'll start with Montana State since they're in third. And I think that um, the uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually the most – the easiest answer among the three teams because I think that Darian White is the most important player for Montana State. I think they've gotten awesome contributions from all their young freshmen. Tori Martell absolutely deserves to be an all-conference player as well as Montana. But Darian White is just the straw that stirs the drink. I think that more than any other player in the big sky, women's or men's, I think that her contributions go so far beyond the stat sheet. If you just watch her play, She's just such a tremendous um, dictator of everything that happens in the game, uh, both on offense and defense. So I think she's their most complete player. If Idaho wins, I think that they have multiple um, young ladies that could be considered for MVP. Gabby Harrington has had a breakout year. Um, if there was a, a transfer of the year type award, she would definitely get it. Uh, you can't really call her a newcomer since she spent the first three years of her career at Montana. But she's had a great, uh, great season. I think Gina Markson's been great as well. But I think that Beyonce Bay has really taken herself to the top level of the league. I think she's been the most consistent producer. So if Idaho wins, I'm going with Beyonce Bay. That those two are Darren White, Beyonce Bay. That's a pretty good indication of things that people in the league should be excited for because both those young ladies are only soft. And then Idaho State is so many big time contributors. They have been so balanced. I mean, Idaho State is in first place in the league without winning a player of the week award because they just haven't had any single player that has performed and put up crazy numbers in back-to-back -back games. That's how balanced they are. So you could talk about Diaba Canote, you could talk about Dora Goles, you could talk about Estefania Ors. Uh, but I think that if Idaho State wins the league, Callie Bourne's the MVP. It might sound crazy to say that somebody only averaging 10 or 11 points per game is the league MVP. But I think that she does so much in terms of the way that they move the ball offensively. She can play on the ball and off the ball. And I think she's their best defender, both on the perimeter and in the post. So uh, I just think I test wise, she is the most important player on their team. But I think you can't I mean, you can't really go wrong because they have four all conference caliber players, I think, at Idaho State. I think that's why they're in first place. So uh, those are sort of my three choices, just depending on who wins the league. Well, absolutely. And like you said, it's so great to see all these teams competing at such a high level that we're even having to have this conversation of there's so many people that are setting themselves maybe apart from the rest, but even that small group at the top, they're all deserving. You know, they're all leading their teams where they're supposed to be. They're making that impact. So it'll be very interesting to see who comes out on top and who is named the Big Sky Women's Basketball MVP this year. Uh, we're just gonna slide over a little bit. You know, you just told us what you thought or who you thought the women's possible MVPs would be. What about on our men's side? Well, on the men's side, I think it's a three-pronged answer as well because we still have an open race for the men's championships as well. Um, I think it's, going to come down to probably somebody from Eastern Washington or Weber State, but somebody from Southern Utah might slide in there. Uh, but we've Southern Utah out for now because I think they're, they're balanced. I don't know if they have a true defined MVP candidate. Um, I think if Weber State wins the league, I think it's Isaiah Brown. Uh, he's the everything scorer in the conference back uh, for Weber State. And I think that there's a twofold story there as well. 
not only has he been tremendous at Weber, not only has he got them in the hunt for the league title, but Randy Ray getting him to Weber State also kept him from going to Montana and Montana State. He was definitely in the mix to go to one of the two Montana schools as well. So twofold, Randy Ray gets one of the best players in the league and a couple of his rivals don't. And so I think that has a huge impact on the league as well. But Isaiah Brown's been great. I think he's an awesome shot maker. He's an explosive scorer. And uh, he's one of those guys where he can go get you 30 if you need it. And I think that's what's going to give Weber a real chance in the tournament because I think that he can truly put you on his back and lead you. If Eastern Washington wins it, I would actually be sort of inclined to vote for Kim Aiken because I think he's the heart and soul of that team. I think he's the best two-way player of that. But I think if Eastern wins it, the MVP will go to Tanner Groves. And that continues uh, an interesting trend. The Big Sky is such a guard-heavy league on the men's side. Yet, if Tanner Groves wins the MVP, that'll be the fourth time in five years the big guy has won the MVP. And what's the common thread there? They all played at Eastern Washington. And so I think it's a testament to the way that they've recruited and developed again, and the fact that, you know, he's in Blizniak was. Uh, he is kind of similar to Mason Peatling, who was last year's MVP. But I think that the thing that Eastern does better than anybody in the league is that they recruit not just talent, and they don't just develop that talent well, but the thing that they recruit in their big guys is big guys that play as hard as they possibly can. And I think that's the binding factor with all those guys is the effort. They just have such a high motor. And so um, I think that it is impressive. It shows just what continuity can do for a program, too, because I know that Shante Leggins is in his fourth year. But he took over from Jim Hayford, and they run largely the same system. They have largely the same player development strategy. So I think if Eastern wins, I think it'll be one of those two guys, Kim Aiken or Tanner Groves. But I would be inclined to give it to Tanner Groves. Ooh, that's a that's a – Heavy lift right there that you're saying, and we're just a few days out um, after this weekend to know who will be named the Big Sky Men's MVP. We'll be right back. We're going to kick it over to Mary Lou's Cook as she's going to talk about the Big Sky Players of the Week. Thanks, Denise. On the women's side, we saw sophomore forward Darren Hickok of Weber State Women's Basketball earn the honor after leading the Wildcats to a pair of home wins over Sacramento State. She averaged 25 points, seven rebounds, and two steals per game, and shot 62% from the field to lead the Wildcats to the sweep over the Hornets. The 25 points she shot in both games set new season highs. Now on the men's side, we saw Dre Marin of Southern Utah men's basketball earn the honor for the first time in his career after leading the T-Birds to a sweep over Northern Arizona. On Wednesday, he surpassed the 1,000-point barrier to become the 12th player in Southern Utah men's basketball history to reach the milestone. Across the two games against the Lumberjacks, Marin averaged 20.5 points per game, 4.5 rebounds, and shot a perfect 100% from the free throw line. Back to you, Denise. Thank you, Mary Lou, for talking about the Big Sky Players of the Week. And now we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty. So, Coulter, we do have the Big Sky Basketball Championships coming up in Boise at Idaho Central Arena next week. But the question I have for you is just talk about some of your favorite past tournament moments, um, whether that was previous years in Boise, in Reno, or when we were hosting on campus sites. What is a memory on the women's side that you remember so fondly? I remember several. I remember the first day of the quarterfinals the first year in Reno on the women's tournament was absolutely, this is not an exaggeration. It was the craziest day of basketball I've ever watched in my entire career of covering this league. Montana State was the number one seed that year, and they lost on a three-quarter court buzzer beater. And it was, at the same time, the most amazing shot I've ever seen and also so devastating because they were, you know, the league champions, and then they, they was just over. And, I mean, I remember that press conference vividly. Jasmine Hamas, who was the MVP of the league, uh, I mean, she just – she was completely torn apart. But I think that's why we love sports too, though, is just the emotion that's attached to it. And I think that that exact moment showed the runs you can make in Boise because that ninth seed at Idaho State team, they went all the way to the championship. They wrecked the bracket. And then they, Steven Sobolewski proved that you can play four games in a week and you can contend for the championship no matter what you are coming into the tournament. So that was an epic, that was kind of the beginning of an epic day that Weber State, um, uh, Idaho game went to like double overtime. Taylor Pierce had a fall away three to send it to the second overtime. That was a crazy game as well. Uh, it was just kind of a back and forth day. I remember uh, there was a, I think three of the four games came down to the final shot. So that was awesome. Uh, a couple other moments that I remember Tana State when they didn't ship and some of the same players that on that team that lost the heartbreaker, then they were able to go to the NCAA tournament like Peyton Ferris. That was a pretty cool moment considering everything she had gone through. I mean, she's, uh, 
I mean, she's from Twin Bridges, Montana, which is population 200. I mean, it's tiny. And to, to be a Class C player in Montana to then lead her team to the NCAA tournament, uh, certainly it was epic, no doubt. I thought when Northern Colorado sewed up their championship as well, that team had gone through so much, both Savannah Smith and um, – um, they both both of their key guards had suffered torn ACLs and had come back from that. And it was, it was sort of just a, a triumphant moment. As far as my probably most memorable moment from a non-neutral side on the women's side, it's when the Lady Grizz hosted Northern Colorado. And Northern Colorado was up 20 points with 10 minutes to go in the game. And Lady Grizz came all the way back. And that was the last time Robin Selvig ever went to the NCAA tournament. But it was the perfect moment to encompass just the magic that was Dahlberg Arena when Robin Selvig was the coach. They had such an unbelievable home court advantage. And I'm not even sure the Lady Grizz was that game. I think Northern Colorado was. But that moment where they just came all the way back and sent Coach Selvig to one last NCAA tournament, uh, that was a pretty epic moment and a, a, a cool moment in the history of the league as well. And that's exactly what March Madness is about. We're in March. The madness was happening this year, definitely in January and February. But all these moments that you've just touched upon is what makes, you know, that thrill and that excitement for this time in March. You know, whether you're a basketball fan, football fan, soccer fan, it doesn't matter. It's like all of America joins around and they're turning on all these tournaments just to be able to see these shining moments you'll say that are happening you've told us so many memories on the women's side what are a few men's memories tournaments uh appearances and stuff that stands out to you anthony johnson montana over weaver state weaver was winning that game by 20 plus points anthony johnson i think he scored 30 in a row i mean the guy won an SB award for it. it was it was one of the great moments in the history of the big sky and that was a pretty cool moment to watch and I know that that was one that haunted Randy Ray for a long time at Weber State because it was a, a pretty um, devastating loss. A pretty devastating loss for his team, but Anthony Johnson's performance was nothing short of epic. A couple other ones I remember. I remember Travis DeCure from Montana cutting down the net for the first time and Stu Morrill, who had been the coach at Montana years and years ago when Travis was a player was in Reno to see that. And uh, just the, the embrace that they had after Travis had won the tournament for the first time and was going to big dance for the first time. That was, that was a pretty cool moment because it was kind of a convergence of generations. I remember probably the best game we've seen in the neutral site, an era, I, I guess we'll call it, was in North Dakota and Weber State just went up and down the court. It was such an entertaining game. And when North Dakota won, the moment of Quentin Hooker putting on his hat and then having his dad come give him a hug. That was that was pretty epic. The stuff I love is when they, that probably the best moment of the Big Sky Conference tournament every single year is actually the post-game celebration with the champions because you just see just this unfettered emotion. And so many of these athletes, they've gone through so much to get to this point. And this year will be, I think, even greater because I think everybody's gone through so much this last year. But I think those moments at the very end when, when they finally do seize that goal and, and they affirm that victory, those are, those are the things that I think we, we love about sports and the things that uh, we love about this tournament. You know, absolutely. I'm sitting here as you're talking, thinking back visually, what are some moments that maybe we've, you know, your brother has caught those photos of. And For I'm sure. thinking of Desiree Hansen, you know, laying on the ground and Boise confetti all around her, just absorbing that moment as the Vikings win the championship they're headed to the NCAA championship. You know, you go to the men's side where you see when Montana wins and that embrace of the teammates together and that confetti is just in the background. And I think that, like you just said, the, the smiles on the faces, the embraces, the that true emotion that is coming out of the coaches and student athletes and staff that have prepared more than just this year. You know, some of these have been preparing since they maybe got the job two, three, four years ago to get to this moment. And I think that it's things like that that make, once again, March and conference tournaments so exciting um, for fans to cheer on. It's talking about moments and exciting. What are a few of those just last second shots? Like, you know, it's coming. You mentioned the one already, you know, that unfortunately in, for Montana State's sake took them down. Who are you? going to right now to ask to take the last shot on the women's side? Well, I think that 
she has established herself because she's she's done it twice now in the last month. That's Tori Martell at Montana State. I thought the the play that they ran for her to to hit the three to send it to overtime against Idaho State two weeks ago was beautiful. It was perfectly executed, and uh, Tori Martell, if she has her feet set, she is the best shooter in the league by by a lot. I mean, I think she could beat all the guys in the shooting contest for sure if she gets her feet set. So. Uh, she she is uh, she's gonna be she's gonna be somebody that's gonna have a, a lot of invites to play city league basketball when her career is over because I think everybody's gonna want her on their team because she is just knocked down right now and I think they're running a ton of cool stuff to get her open and uh, help her thrive um, and then on the men's side there's a lot of different answers one guy I think that hasn't been talked about on this as we've been doing this all season long who I think deserves a ton of credit is. Michael Meadows at Eastern Washington. Uh, Jacob Davidson has gone through a bunch of um, illness, we'll say. And so he, you know, the preseason MVP has, has not been played as many minutes. And in his spot, Michael Meadows has really stepped up. And I've seen him hit big shots three weekends in a row, um, both at Montana, Montana State. And the fact that he is filled in for the preseason MVP in the league and given Eastern pretty much identical production. I mean, he's averaging 18 points a game since he's gotten the starting lineup. That's pretty impressive. And I think that that uh, probably should scare the rest of the league since he's only a sophomore. Um, but I think he's been really good. And the other one is uh, this guy, I have the hardest time saying his name, but we're just going to call him Sohoho Jawara. I can never say his first name, but he's got, he's the three name guy at Weaver State, but Sohoho Jawara, uh, the Loyola Marymount transfer, he's been outstanding as well. And, and he's a guy I actually think could be sort of a, uh, dark horse all league candidate but i would definitely trust him with the ball in his hands and uh to take a last shot for sure all this craziness going on and you kind of touched on it a little bit because our next question is or statement is who, don't sleep on this team right who's the team that just is showing you signs of although they may not be necessarily in the top three in the conference right now that they can very well make a splash in Boise. In past years on the women's side, it has definitely been Idaho State. You know, they're like that terminator for the tournament coming in as maybe a lower seed and being able to pick up games. Past couple of years, Southern Utah men have emerged, you know, taking wins where they can get them. But right now in 2021 on the women's side, who is the team that people shouldn't sleep on? I think that the answer is Northern Arizona. I think that they have gone through, everybody's been going through a lot of different things, but Northern Arizona has gone through a lot this year. Uh, I think that they have really, they, they made a concerted effort to make a stand for social justice. I think that's been impressive that they have been so vocal about the way, the things that they believe in. I know that that's come with some controversy, but I think they should be um, praised for that because I think it's taken, taken a lot of courage. They've had multiple players that I, out because of the the uh, affairs in the world, and then Creeker, who's the preseason MVP, has all that said. I think that they have gritting and splitting and splitting and splitting. But I think if they can get uh, on track, then I think that they have a real chance to make a run in the tournament. And I think when you have the talent that they have, they'll definitely be a real threat when we get to Boise. Who's the uh sleeper team on the men's side it's so hard just call them the sleeper because they've won the last two tournaments but it's montana um montana it's been what i live in missoula for people that are watching that don't know that uh so i cover the grizz as prevalently as anybody in the league through skyline sports um the grizz are in the midst of a season that i've never really seen them have they have they don't, they've been so successful over the last 20 years that they haven't really had to rebuild. But Travis Takir has really dug his heels in and trying to rebuild a program without bringing in a bunch of transfers. Therefore, they're the youngest team in the league. They have lost six games in conference play by a single possession. They finally turned the corner on Saturday and they won a game by a point. Mm -hmm. You have to think that that's going to be a confidence booster for them. Yeah. I think on a neutral site with the type of coach that Travis DeCure is, I think you can't count the Grizz out until they're out. I, I think that they are the defending champions in this tournament two years in a row. 
I think last year, if the tournament wouldn't have gotten canceled, Montana would have had something to say about the end result as well. And I know that they've struggled. They've really struggled to score the ball this year. But I think on a neutral site, um, they are a real threat. That said, I think that Eastern Washington, Weber State, and Southern Utah are all very, very good. And I think they are all the favorites coming into this thing. But I guarantee you that no one wants to play the Grizz because if those guys click from a confidence standpoint, they have a coach that has proven over and over and over again. I mean, Travis DeCure's played in four of the last six Big Sky title games. So I think they have a coach that's proven um, oh, repeatedly that he can get his team to the top and get them into at least the championship game. So I, I think the answer on the men's side is Montana. Well, Coulter, I don't know who's going to win. You don't know who's going to win, but we can pretty much guarantee you that the games are going to be exciting. We are going to have some down to the wire games and that's just what makes March Madness so great. Thank you for joining me so much today. We will see you in Boise next week for the men's and women's basketball championship going on at Idaho Central Arena. March 8th through the 13th. As always, thank you so much for joining us on this week in Big Sky Basketball. And we'll take it over to Mary Louise Cook as she'll talk about the standings as we head into the final weekend of regular season play. The last week of the regular season has arrived, which means that Big Sky and Boise kicks off in less than a week. On the women's side, Northern Colorado is now riding the longest win streak in the conference with four. After picking up a sweep over Portland State, the Bears were led by Alicia Davis, who recorded her 12th double-double of the season and 19th of her career. Idaho State continues to lead the standings after sweeping the Lady Grizz in Missoula. Of note, Weber State picked up their first pair of wins at home over Sacramento State. The Wildcats were led by Big Sky Player of the Week, Darren Hickok, who set new season highs in both games against the Hornets. In their Thursday game, five players scored double-digit figures. That, combined with tough defense, allowed them to come away with the sweep. On the men's side, Eastern Washington still holds the top spot in the Big Sky standings with an 11-2 record in conference play. Coming out of their bye week, the Eagles will host Idaho State this week and look to add to a nine-game win streak. Montana, Southern Utah, and Weber State earned conference sweeps last week as the Grizz defeated Idaho State, the Thunderbirds beat Northern Arizona, and the Wildcats notched two victories over Sacramento State. Of note, Idaho won its first game of the season last week with a five-point home victory over Montana State on Friday. Damon Thacker scored 22 points and shot 50% from the field to lead Idaho. The Bobcats came back on Sunday and split the series with the Vandals. Now know that you can catch all the Big Sky basketball action for free on Pluto TV. Although this marks our last episode of This Week in Big Sky Basketball for the season, we thank you for joining us and invite you to keep the conversation going on social media, especially during Big Sky in Boise. Be sure to give that Big Sky Conf a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And as always, if you're looking for around-the-clock information, on Big Sky Basketball, as well as post-game interviews during Big Sky and Boise, be sure to follow at Big Sky WBB and at Big Sky MBB. Thanks for joining us this season for this week in Big Sky Basketball.